The International Forum on Youth is delighted to have you here. Um, Dr. Kud is a specialist in cancer risk factors, targeted cancer therapies, and the biology of tumor formation, and is also a brilliant photomicrographs artist and a TEDx alum. We are very fortunate to have her as a presenter today for our International Forum on Youth and as an instructor at COC, where she works to increase science literacy within her students by dispelling common science myths and installing an appreciation for critical thinking. She has also taught at Western Washington University and conducted research at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, with that, I am happy to turn the mic over to Dr. Ku. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Tim, and thank you to the committee for inviting me to be here. Um, I am, cancer is my personal passion, and I'm always excited to share what I know about this with people um, in my community. I can see my video stopped. I don't know if my sound stopped as well. Someone. Okay. We can still hear you. Okay. Yeah, you fine. Oh, and we're back in my living room again. I think it might just run this way for me today. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, I'm really thankful to be here, and when the uh, organizers told me about the theme, the theme of this forum, which has been this week-long global international presentations, was um, interdisciplinary ideas on migration. And I tried to think, how on earth can I relate that to cancer biology, which is my field of study? And I, I landed on this idea of cancer myths. Um, they're so prevalent, they're pervasive, um, they persist. They travel around the world through social media, through um, news networks. And I think that um, it's really important for us to take this opportunity to look at some of these myths and to address um, why they happen and what we can do to sort of protect ourselves from falling into the trap of listening to these myths or following the advice that's given from these. So I'd like to begin by sharing my screen um, to my presentation. And the main uh, myth that I will be addressing today is, uh, whoopsies, does everything really cause cancer? Um, and I'm going to begin with treating you guys as if you are my students on the first day of class. Um, the first day of class, I come in and I say to my students, okay, this is our icebreaker. I want you to turn to your neighbor and I want you to tell me and list everything you think you've heard or know causes cancer. And the students dive right in. They, they get about 30 minutes to do this. And you guys are going to do it too. But um, to help you out and to keep you to uh, like a two-minute time limit, um, I'm going to give you guys a list of possible things. So what I'd like the audience, right, this is audience participation um, right now, is I have listed some things for you. They are either things that are thought to cause cancer or to prevent cancer. And what I would like you to do is look through the list and choose three things that you think are facts. And once you've chosen your three things, I would like you guys to write them into the chat. And we're gonna monitor it for a couple minutes just to see what people are coming up with. You can talk to each other and say, hey, I chose that one too, or wait a minute, I'm not sure about that. But go ahead, get in that chat look through this list. And then um, of course, like any good teacher, I'm not gonna give the answers till the end of the talk. Um, that's how I, I can keep you here for the full time. But I'll give you guys now, you have just uh, under two minutes to look through this list and come up with your ideas. Okay. No fair putting bacon on both lists, both as a cure <laughs> and as a cause. <laughs> I think the world would love it if bacon was a cure. I think that uh, I think a lot of us would be set for life if that was true. <laughs> I often say that about cheese as well. Um, cheese is the best food <laughs> that's ever been invented. Okay, I'm seeing a good list coming out, you guys. Fantastic. I see a lot of you guys are coming up with some similar ideas. We had a Korean barbecue fly by. I wasn't sure which side of the list that was on. Uh oh. I'm hoping it's on prevent. Um, I won't tell you. <laughs> I won't tell you yet. How about that? Keep the dream alive for another 30 minutes. 
This is fantastic, you guys. Great list coming in. About another 30 seconds, just because I got to stay on time today, just like any professor. Okay, I'm seeing a lot about these sweeteners. I'm seeing a lot of GMOs coming up. Um, meat is coming up a lot, okay. It's good to see where your heads are. A lot of you, your heads are in food and uh, I, don't, I don't disagree with you. That's a place where I, I like to be a lot as well. Oh, okay, someone is figuring out things that can help, good. <laughs> uh, Saab, I have to tell you, uh, as a vegetarian who eats a lot of soy, I had a pretty big panic moment when I saw that come out. So let's hopefully address that um, as a group. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll just give you another few seconds here. I love that you guys are participating. Um, it makes me feel more like I am in the classroom and, and interacting with you guys. Um, I promise you that I will give you the answers and um, we'll go through each one of these and you'll get to see if you were right or maybe you need to adjust your uh, view a little bit. Okay, so I, the chat is still lighting up. Let every single person get their last things in, it looks like. Okay, so um, actually what I'm gonna do really quick is hide this panel because it's in my way. Nope, wrong one. Um, yes, there, okay. So what I would like to do is um, now continue with the presentation if everybody is kind of had a chance to put in their choices. And I'm going to start my talk with a little discussion about that problem of myths and misinformation, um, just for the first you know, five or 10 minutes. And then I promise we'll spend the rest of the time talking specifically about cancer myths. So. Um, Darwin is the person who said, great is the power of steady misrepresentation. So when you think about these myths or this misinformation, it's not just like your neighbor says something and then that goes around the world. Um, how is it that these myths become established? And it's really because we have social media, marketing, news, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. They're constantly hitting us with these endless um, sort of blatant misinformation. And the one, of course, that I will be addressing today is that everything causes cancer, which is usually something that my students come up with within the first couple of minutes. So what types of misinformation are there? Um, misinformation includes using outdated information. So in science, we understand that we have a preliminary finding. Sometimes the news gets really excited and runs and tells everybody the headline of the day. Um, but in science, we that we need to be able to reproduce data. We need to be able to have multiple independent groups um, kind of go in and work out the details of those experiments. So you really want to look for the most up-to-date information. Looking at an old study can be somewhat misleading. Um, another common thing is to oversimplify a really complex scientific concept and try to break it down into like a really simple process. And this can lead to misinterpretation or misrepresentation of information. And then the last one, which I, I, admit, I mean, I think any of you that are being honest will also admit um, that we sometimes cherry pick, which is to say we tell half the truth or we basically select certain pieces of data um, that kind of support our side of the story. And I think we're all a little guilty of that, um, but definitely with these myths, we see that happening a lot. So um, why do these myths spread? Why do they continue to move around, move through social media circles? I've, um, I think a really big one right now in the time of COVID is that we feel a little lonely. I mean, it's so weird for me, you guys, being in my living room, um, talking to you right now, not being actually somewhere where I can see you face to face. And so we're looking to build that social identity. That means that we, we want to connect to other people. And so if we're sharing something on social media and we like it, and then eight more people like it, and then they share it, it feels like we're part of that community. And, it, and that's a really strong driving force for social behavior. Um, another reason that these spread is because people are trying to get a profit. So um, I don't want to say everybody trying to sell you something is lying, um, but you just need to always think about their motivations for selling you something and then look at the evidence that they're providing. 
And then lastly, and I do think that this is something that we've all experienced probably in this last year is um, political gain. People, you know, for example, climate change. Um, people are gonna come down one side or the other side according to their political preference. And then they're gonna try to weaponize science to um, make their case. And so I think these will continue to perpetuate um, the spread of these. If we ask ourselves, why do they continue to persist? So um, as an instructor, I actually will hear a myth. I'll tell you one right now. I know I told you I'd wait to the end. Um, plastic water bottles cause cancer. Uh, that first came out in 2005. And even though there's been lots of science that has shown that that isn't true, and for a while it seemed like that myth went away, um, just starting in my class last year again, I started hearing students talking about it. So it's like it's come back around and that myth is present in our um, vision right now. So there's three reasons why some of these myths persist. One is called the illusory truth effect. And this means that um, if we've heard something a lot of times, we tend to be more willing to believe that it's true. So I will give you an example. Um, how many of you, you can raise your hand, it's fine. How many have, have heard that if you have wet hair and it's cold outside, you shouldn't go outside because you're gonna catch a cold. Um, you're gonna, you know, my mom would always say, you're gonna catch a death of cold, don't go outside with wet hair. Um, mom, I'm not picking on you. I think that this is uh, generations across the world have said this to their children um, and there's no truth in that. Um, of course, colds are caused by a virus, not by having wet hair or you yourself being cold. So another thing is that they use um, pervasive emotional appeal. So this is just marketing 101. Um, let's make it as emotional, as clickbaity as possible. Something like GMOs are killing your children. Um, like everyone's going to click, 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 want to want to see what's happening there. And I think that that's that human nature of people wanting to make smart choices, healthy choices um, for themselves and their family. So when you emotionally charge something, that's going to be something that really sucks people in. Um, and then lastly is that confirmation bias. And again, um, I'm guilty. I think that um, a lot of us are probably guilty. We are wired to look for information that reinforces what we already believe. So, and this can sometimes be good if what you believe is scientifically accurate, um, but it can be bad if you're supporting prejudices or inaccurate information. So we have to be, all of us, careful not to um, be persuaded and to just look for information on one side of the story. Um, so lastly, why specifically does science myths persist? So this is a question I ask myself all the time. I think about, okay, myths exist in all areas. You know, there are myths in history, there are myths in political science, there are myths in English. Um, and I'm like, but science is fact-based, so how could there be myths in science? Um, and it really comes down to sort of a global mistrust of science. Um, it breaks my heart, but it's true. They have measured um, in 2018, 140,000 people from 140 countries around the world. And they found that only 18% of them said that they had a high trust in scientists and in the science they produce, um, which is just a little bit of a tear for me um, <laughs> and something that I think scientists really need to work on how can we bridge that gap with the community and reestablish that trust um, that needs to be there for the benefit of all people. So um, before we just become super depressed and um, decide that everyone's lying to us, which is really not the case, um, I just want to quickly tell how do we combat this problem of misinformation? So one thing I would really urge you to do is to ask questions. Don't just see a headline and believe it. Um, open the article, read the article, look at the source. Are there biases? Um, have they provided any evidence or are they just using a, a like emotional clickbait to convince you? Do some fact checking. Um, there's really easy websites where they, um, Snopes is an example. You can put in a story and they will actually go and fact check the information for you. So um, there's a great use for those types of tools um, that can help you with that research. And then lastly, I would say look for scientific consensus. 
So you um, might hear like one scientist going sort of against the grain and saying something that's completely different than most other scientists, but it's be incredibly rare for an entire scientific community to agree on something that is false um, because we have a lot of checks and balances built into science, something called peer review. So if there's scientific consensus, then it's most likely that you can trust that information. So um, just this last quote down here really hit me. I was reading an article about COVID and the BBC a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the author said that um, the disease of, of disinformation remains virulent. And it just really got to me. It made me think about how misinformation is almost like a virus. Um, it infects you, you think about it, then you spread it to others, they spread it to others. So we really need to work as a global community to try to stop the spread of misinformation. So I'm, now I'm gonna switch to our main topic for today, um, which is understanding cancer and cancer myths, because I think that's why most of you um, tuned in today to hear about this. So one thing um, before I get to the myths, I think I probably should just give you a little background on what is cancer, um, what are carcinogens, and then I'm going to tell you about the different groups or categories of carcinogens. I know that's weird, but not all carcinogens are created equal. We have to think about that. Um, I will also discuss the importance of dose. So maybe you guys have heard this, the dose makes the poison. Um, it's because um, we have to think about how much exposure would a normal person have to one of these substances and does that make it actually dangerous to us or is it something that will probably never be a real threat. And then we will go to our activity and we'll go through each of the facts and myths so that you guys can check your work on that. Sounds good? Okay. So let's begin with what is cancer. So cancer is a family of diseases. It's actually more than a hundred of different diseases. And um, they're related to each other, but they are different, genetically speaking. So if someone has breast cancer, that is one disease and lung cancer is a separate disease. We have different treatments, we have different diagnostic tools, um, and that individual will have a different reason for why their cancer formed. Um, all cancers form from an accumulation of genetic mutations that cause the cells in the body to divide out of control. So that is the basic premise of why cancer forms. Um, and then one thing, because this is a global audience today, um, I usually think only about United States statistics, but I went and I looked up more about global statistics. This really is a global public health crisis. Um, one in six people in the world who dies is going to die from cancer. There were 18.1 million cases of cancer that occurred in 2018. And of those, um, nearly 50% were in Asia. So Asia is disproportionately impacted, carrying a larger percentage of the cancer cases, and even still a larger percentage of the cancer death. So about, um, they, rep they represent about 48% of the cases, and they represent 57% of the deaths. So we can see that cancer is not just affecting one country, um, and different countries are gonna have different types of cancers and different death rates. Um, again, before we get super depressed, um, nearly 50% of the most common cancers can be prevented. So there is hope. Um, and how are we gonna do prevention? Um, mostly it's gonna focus on figuring out what the risk factors are and doing what you can um, to help avoid risk factors for yourself and your family. Um, so how or what causes cancer? Um, one of the things that I hear from students a lot, they tell me, oh, well, I don't have a family history of cancer, so I'm okay. Um, unfortunately, only 10% of cancers are inherited. So that's cancer that is actually something that is being passed down to you through your family. And 90% of cancer is sporadic. So that means spontaneous. Um, that particular individual was exposed to something 
in their life that damage their DNA. And that's what 90% of the cancer cases are. So this DNA damage, this picture that I have at the bottom, and there's some example causes down here that you can look at if you feel like, um, but the root cause of all cancer is DNA damage. So if DNA damage is what causes cancer, then a carcinogen, which is a chemical that causes cancer, must have the ability to damage DNA. So did that track? Everyone's following that logic, right? So DNA damage is the cause of cancer. So if you are something that causes cancer, you must be able to damage DNA. Um, and that category of carcinogen is called a tumor initiator. And 90% of the things that we find that cause cancer fall into this category. Now there's one other group of chemicals that we know can help cancer grow, and these are called tumor promoters. Now a tumor promoter takes a cell in your body that has already been damaged. So you, you had to have the DNA damage first, and then it promotes the growth of those cells. So it's something that helps them to survive and grow after they've been damaged. And that represents about 10% of known cancer causing agents. So big takeaway point right now, what are carcinogens? They have to either be something that damages DNA or something that promotes cell division. So those are the only two possibilities. Um, any chemical or any substance that doesn't do one of those two things is not causing cancer. So obviously it's not everything causes cancer. So we're already starting to debunk that myth. Okay, so where are we as far as testing? Um, this slide sometimes makes me sad. Um, according to the American Chemical Society, there are more than 6 million chemicals that exist. Um, but of those, there's about 50,000 that people come into contact with on a sort of daily basis. Um, so, I mean, just think about like what's in your toothpaste, what's in the soap that you wash your face with, what's in the food that you eat, right? So we're, there's constantly chemicals around us. Most of them are completely harmless. Um, and of those, scientists have so far thoroughly tested 1,013. So these here, this 1,013 are the chemicals that have been tested so far to see if they're carcinogenic or not. Um, you might ask yourself, well, why did they choose those 1,013? Um, they chose those chemicals based on things that people are exposed to most um, and things that have been suspected to cause cancer due to people that work with those chemicals at their job. So for example, car mechanics have a higher risk of certain types of cancer. Um, and they look at some of the chemicals that are, are found within a car garage or in a car engine because they have already that suspicion that something might be linked to cancer. So out of these 1,013, so far 120 have been found to be group one carcinogens. Um, so that's a pretty small number considering how many chemicals are out there, but that's 120 things that they have shown definitively do cause cancer. And then there's 82 in a group 2A, and that is a group of carcinogens that we say it's very likely these cause cancer, but we still need to do a little bit more research. So let me quickly just show you the different groups of carcinogens. So you can kind of understand what I'm talking about. Um, they're classified by number here. Group one, these are the ones that we know do cause cancer. So there's that 120 that we saw previously. Um, just for fun, I listed some examples for you here. Um, so you guys can start to already look at your myths and facts that you are coming up with. Um, group 2A, these are the ones that are considered probably carcinogenic. So probably because if you look at the small print underneath, they have shown in animals that these do cause cancer. Because animals are genetically similar to us, if it causes cancer in animals, we should be concerned that it might cause cancer in people. So they're still not in group one because you can see here they have limited evidence in humans. So this means that they haven't yet shown it happens in humans as well. So they're gonna do more research. But I would be really cautious around any chemical that's um, found within group one or two A. 
The group 2B chemicals, which you can see there's 311 listed there, these are considered possibly carcinogenic. So the evidence is not as strong as what we see in 2A. Um, you can see here, they say there's insufficient evidence in animals. And what that usually means is that they have some studies that said, yes, it did cause cancer. And they have other studies that say, no, it doesn't cause cancer. And so when you have sort of that conflicting evidence, um, it's gonna be in the insufficient category. Um, there's, so there's a lot of chemicals in group 2B that they're still doing more research. And then group three. So these say that they're not classified as carcinogenic. Um, and this is because there's that inadequate evidence in animals and there's no evidence in humans either. So that is where most of these 1,013 chemicals are listed. Um, and you can see here there's 500. And just so you know, um, every time I give a presentation like this, I have to go in and look up this information because it's constantly changing. This research is happening every single day in labs around the world. So these numbers are constantly updating. Okay, so remember I mentioned to you the importance of dose. And I said, just because something can cause cancer doesn't mean it will. Um, so what we think about for these genotoxic, so genotoxic, that's this fancy word right here. That type of a carcinogen means something that damages your DNA. What we have learned is that you need to have a pretty chronic exposure to these chemicals for them to be something that will damage your DNA enough to cause cancer. So usually we're, we're thinking of like years or decades of being exposed to this. And so there's three places where this is most likely to happen. Um, first is your job. So occupational exposure is your number one um, hazard. Because if you're working in a job that works with dangerous chemicals, say that you work as a firefighter or um, you work in a petroleum refinery plant, um, you work on making plastics, you work in agriculture as a farmer where they spray lots of pesticides. So that, uh, that occupational exposure is actually what can be concerning because you're going to be exposed to those chemicals daily for years on end. Um, the other place is food. Um, we love our food. Um, we love to think that our food would never do anything bad for us. Um, but our food is something that actually um, can contain things that are not good for us. Um, and we tend to have habits of eating the same types of food. Um, you guys might think about this. Think about the food you've eaten in the last month. Um, think about how many times you ate almost the same thing, whether it was like, I always get a salad that has the same vegetables or I always eat the same type of pizza. So we do have that chronic exposure because we are sort of creatures of habit when it comes to our food. And then the last thing for that um, way to get a high enough dose would be personal habits like smoking. Now, whether it's cigarettes, cigars, pipe, hookah, um, even vaping, this, all of these are things that are going to view chronic exposure over time um, because most people become addicted to those habits and then end up using those types of um, like smoking or drinking for years at a time. So now it's time, the, the time you guys have been waiting for, for us to go through, sorry, the picture just disappeared for me for a second. Now it's time for us to um, go through some of these myths and um, I hope you guys are ready to look at your list. Okay, so just as a reminder, this is a list that we all looked at when we started. And I'm gonna just start going through these. And I have, I have to warn you that I might not have put these in order <laughs> in the slides. So if anybody right now wants to like take a quick screenshot with their phone so they have a picture of the list with them, go ahead and do that um, for just a second. And um, I'm going to then move forward into the myths. Is everybody ready? How are we feeling? Are we feeling like, yes, let's dispel some myths. Okay, we're ready, let's do it. First one, and let me just hide this floating meeting control. Diet soda causes cancer. Okay, this one, All right, this is gonna be shocking to most of you, um, but this is a myth. Diet soda does not cause cancer. Um, there were some initial studies. So remember we talked about that, um, looking at old data versus new data is one of the types of misinformation. 
So there were some st studies in the 1970s and they found that rats had, um, that were fed high levels of saccharin or aspartame, which is basically that fake sweetener, um, developed cancer. There were two major problems with this study. Um, first, the dose was not relevant. So in one study done by the European Food Safety Agency, they gave the rats an equivalent um, of 36 cans a day of soda if you were a person who weighed 132 pounds. Now, I don't know if they're giving these rats like little like little tiny bottles of soda that they were cracking open in their cage, um, or it was probably more likely that they were just dosing their water. Um, and one study went all the way up to 2,083 cans a day before they started to see cancer. So it's not a relevant dose because no one on earth is drinking 36 cans of soda a day. Um, so the dose is not relevant, one. Secondly, the mechanism is not correct um, because they actually found out that what happens when the rats drink aspartame or saccharin, it goes into their stomachs and then they digest that chemical into a second chemical. It's actually that second chemical that actually causes cancer. So then the question would be, do we digest the same way, right? Because if we digest the same way, then we're in, and we're in trouble. And the answer is we do not. So we do not digest this chemical the same way. This means that diet soda cannot cause cancer. Now, before all the moms call me and say, why are you telling me that diet soda is healthy? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not trying to tell you it's a healthy choice. I'm just telling you it doesn't cause cancer. One of the unhealthy aspects of diet soda that we do worry about is that that fake sweetener kind of um, makes our bodies crave sugar. It actually makes us crave more sugar than we would if we weren't drinking the diet soda because it sort of recalibrates our insulin levels and our taste buds. So what can happen is you start to eat more sugary foods because the diet soda is kind of like rewiring your body to crave that, and then you become obese. And we do know that obesity causes cancer. So I guess with the tangential to the tangent of the tangent, you could say diet soda can have an influence over cancer. Okay, next myth. Eating sugar causes cancer. This is a myth. There is a secondary myth that says that if you have cancer, you should stop eating sugar, that sugar is going to feed your tumor. So while all cancer cells um, do use sugar, that is a true fact. All the cells in your body use sugar. This is the basis of something called cellular respiration. Maybe my students will be familiar with glycolysis, um, the Krebs cycle, mitochondrial electron transport chain. So yes, sugar is something that cancer cells will eat, but all the cells in your body need to have sugar. You cannot remove sugar from your diet. It's something that could make you very sick and lead to organ failure. Um, however, I do think that there is truth in how we use different types of sugar. So it's definitely more healthy for you to consume sugar that hasn't been overly processed sugar. So the kind of sugar you find in like juice or um, fruits, vegetables, that's definitely a much healthier um, sugar in the way our body digests and use it than something like high fructose corn syrup, which my mom who's here watching knows my, my childhood obsession with Cairo <laughs> and how that was the only thing I wanted to put on my pancakes. I would never use regular syrup. I always wanted that one. So I'm in trouble for that. Um, but that's a highly processed and the way our bodies use fructose versus glucose, I'm not gonna get into the chemistry, but definitely those can lead to obesity. And again, obesity causes cancer. So we do have to be careful about that. Okay, uh, here's a good one. Um, I know so many people who tell me when they're going on a cleanse, they're gonna do colon cleanses, they're gonna take some detox pills, they're gonna put patches on their body. And the whole idea is that um, if I do this, I'm being healthy, I can eat like, whatever Fritos and like fried Twinkies and pizza that I ate last week, but it's okay because I'm going to eat these magic pills this weekend, or I'm going to put these patches on my body and it's going to pull out all of the toxins. And so my risk is going to go back to being zero again. Um, the truth is that your body's kidneys remove all of this from your body. Like that is their 24 hour a day job. If your kidneys were not doing this properly, you would either be hospitalized or dead. So there is nothing you can do to remove these things from your body that your kidneys are not already 
doing. So remember about, we said types of misinformation. Some of it is people doing it for profit. So that is where these myths come from. These are people that are basically doing a marketing scam. So um, there's several articles you can read about this, but let's talk about colon pills for a second. Um, the manufacturers actually spike these pills, which they'll say is like herbal supplements with this plastic polymerizing agent. So you swallow this, this expands in your intestines, turns into this gross plastic-like blob, and then that comes out of your body and you feel like, oh, I'm, I'm a, I feel so good. Look at what I just got out of my body. I got all of those toxins out. I've cleaned myself. Um, no, you basically just got rid of what they put into you with their pill, right? It's not actually doing anything for you. It's the same with these foot pads. Man, I remember when these, these foot pads came out and thinking, I need that. Uh, I need to sleep with those on my feet and it's going to suck out all my toxins. Um, but actually, it turns out that <laughs> the reason that they turn color is because they make your feet hot and then you'll sweat. And these pads change color from white to brown in the presence of sweat. So it's just water and salt that makes them change color. So this is a true scam, right? This is a true form of misinformation where they're telling you to buy these things just so that they can make money and not that there's any health benefit to you. So the good thing is there's probably no health harm to you. So you're just basically hurting your wallet with this. Okay. Uh, Okay, I'm here to ruin your life. Don't hate me forever. <laughs> Here's a fact. So this one, in the, I hope some of you guys got this right in the chat. Bacon does increase your risk for cancer and it's actually pretty significant. Um, it's not just bacon, but I, I pick on bacon because it's the most delicious of the kind of cured, smoked, salted meats that have that crunchiness to them. Um, they often contain nitrosamines uh, nitrosamines can be uh, activated in the presence of heat. Also, if you're cooking this over an open flame, it's going to create something called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, which are, are heterocyclic amines. Both of those are created in that presence, so those are dangerous. Um, and eating just 50 grams, so I put a little picture here to make you all hungry. Um, eating just 50 grams can elevate your cancer risk by 18%. So that'd be basically having four strips of bacon or one hot dog in a day. And some of us might be like, you know what, I'm willing to accept that risk because bacon is delicious. So let me just tell you the types of cancer that it is associated with. <clears throat> uh, colorectal, breast and prostate are all associated with processed meat, but one that they have just identified and this came out, I think last year is that it's the number one risk factor for pancreatic cancer. And that's a big one, right? That's the one that we just lost Alex Trebek to. Pancreatic cancer is known as the silent killer because it's usually not diagnosed until stage four when people um, don't experience any symptoms. So for me, um, that's enough to say like, okay, I think bacon can be gone from my life because pancreatic cancer is something I, I don't wanna mess around with. Um, okay, I know, I know. I put two bad ones back to back, you guys. Um, red meat is something that increases your cancer risk. Um, specifically eating red meat, and they say a high intake, so they, they measure the dose again. Um, having a high dose of red meat um, increases your risk by 28 to 33% for colon cancer. And so my question is, okay, well, what's a high intake? I mean, does this mean like I walk around with a cow that I'm just chewing on? Um, and their definition is three servings a week. So that's not very much. Um, if you think about like, I had some sausage with my breakfast and then three days later I had a ham sandwich for lunch. And then on the weekend I had a steak dinner. There's your three servings right there. Um, here, they've actually looked at it by country since this is a global presentation. I wanted to put some international data in here. You can see the amount of red meat eaten um, per day by persons living in like New Zealand is way out here, but guess what, USA, we're not too far behind. And then you can look all the way down here at other countries that are much smarter. Look at Japan, Saab, you must be so proud. Um, so having um, a lower intake and then this um, axis of the chart is your increased risk for cancer. So you can see that there's that direct relationship there. Okay. 
Um, okay, here's one to make us feel good. Um, again, so we're uh, cell phones causing cancer. And I saw several of you did list these um, in the chat. So initially people were concerned because they took rats in a cage and they exposed them to um, high frequency radio waves. Um, and they developed these really rare tumors called schwannomas, which are actually like kind of in the back of the ear. Um, and they're very rare. We hardly see those forming. So then people got very worried um, because remember animals are similar to us. So we, we get concerned when we see that. Um, but the problem was that the dose was not relevant. So they used a, a level of radiation that was two to three times higher energy level than what is found in cell phones. And then they also had them exposed for nine to 19 hours a day. So I don't think that they had like taped little cell phones to their hands. I think that they probably just had an emitter that was like over their cage. But how many of you guys would say that you're on your phones 19 hours a day? Okay, let me rephrase that. Let me rephrase that before you all panic. Not just holding it, but like on a phone call where you're actually receiving information. I know that we are all attached to it, but most of us are texting or social media, um, which is not the same type of energy, right? So, okay, don't panic people, it's okay. <laughs> um, but the mechanism is also not valid because of radiation. And I'm sorry, this was as big as I could make this picture. And hopefully I can walk you through it. Um, so in our universe, um, on the electromagnetic spectrum, there are a lot of particles that move as wave particles like this, um, which includes visible light, sound waves, um, microwaves, cell phone, x-rays, they all move in that pattern. And we kind of divide them into two categories. We call that some of them non-ionizing, and then we call others ionizing. And so the non-ionizing are lower energy, um, and the ionizing are higher energy. And remember, going back to our, what are the two things that cause cancer if it's gonna be a carcinogen? You have to damage DNA or you have to cause cells to grow. So where do we see DNA damage? Only here, only under ionizing radiation, okay? So cell phones, which are way over here and radios and televisions, they are not of the right frequency or of the right energy level to actually be able to damage our DNA, so they are safe. I would though point out that x-rays are not safe. So do you guys see how x-rays are over here under DNA damage and the ionizing form? And that's why even when you go to the dentist to have an x-ray, what do they do? They cover you with a lead apron, right? And, and I always notice like the dentist or her hygienist is like, I'll be right back, right? And they walk out of the room and they take the x-ray and then they come back. That is because x-rays can cause cancer. And so they're protecting themselves with that occupational level of exposure. Okay, now I did see several people putting this. This is a hot one, you guys. Um, I have so many students who are so proud and they come into, they come running into class and they say, look, I got alkaline water. Aren't you proud of me? And I'm like, oh yes, um, let's talk about that. So there, this is a hoax that was um, started as a circulated myth on Twitter. And they're basing it again, remember that oversimplification that we said can be a problem in science. They're oversimplifying um, a 1931 Nobel Prize. Um, this individual wrote that cancer cells live in an acidic environment. And so everybody who's had basic chemistry knows that um, you can have acids or you can have bases and bases are also called alkaline. So basically the idea is that alkaline would neutralize acids. And so um, they started saying, they were actually clinics, I can't believe this, that they would inject alkaline solutions into your blood saying, so, hey, we're going to get rid of your cancer because we're going to go neutralize that acid. Um, I'm pretty sure people died. I, I haven't seen the study, but I can't imagine that they wouldn't if you did that. Um, that the truth is your blood and your body regulate the pH instantaneously. Like as soon as you put anything, if you eat something that's acidic or if you eat something that's basic, your body is going to instantly go in and start to shift the amount of buffering that's happening to shift that back to the pH that should occur in that part of the body, especially in your bloodstream, which is where most people think that, you know, we're going to affect cancer by changing the pH of your blood. Your blood has both acids and bases that are floating in there and they can regulate the amounts and levels of those to bring the pH back to the, to the level of 7.4, which is where it always has to be. 
So again, this is a myth based off of kind of oversimplifying the problem. Um, it's not going to hurt you to drink this water. It's just going to hurt your wallet. So once again, this is based off of making money. Okay, plastic water bottles. This was really big. And one of the reasons this um, was a big myth is because Cheryl Crow came on Oprah. And she said, I got breast cancer. And the reason I got breast cancer is because I used to leave my water bottles in my car. They would get hot. And then I would drink that water. And maybe you guys have done this before because I have. And the water tastes like not good anymore, right? There's like a little chemically aftertaste to it. Um, and so people kind of took that and ran with it and made these social media things saying that there's these toxic things that are in plastic. Um, the chemicals are called dioxins or bisphenol A. And because those are in plastics, this taste that you have in your water bottle are those chemicals leaching out and then you're gonna give yourself cancer. So there's some pretty significant problems with this. Um, they should have looked at what type of plastic is used to make water bottles because um, dioxins are not used in that type of plastic. Dioxins are used more in like industrial plastics. Um, so this would be something that someone that works in a plastic uh, industry or in one of their factories would have to be worried about, but you don't have to worry about that in your drinking water. And bisphenol A is also something that is not used in disposable water bottles. Um, and in this country, it hasn't been used for decades. It's still used in some other countries around the world to make the kind of water bottles that are like the baby bottle, you know, that like hard plastic that is hard to like bend. Um, so that type of plastic could contain BPA, but not in the United States. Okay, I can see I'm running out of time as I knew what happened. I'll try to go faster. Um, microwaving plastics. So um, microwaving plastics are something that people um, worried about because they know that like maybe those plastics are leaching uh, into their food and then they're eating that food. So the type of plastics that people were worried about are things called phthalates. And um, Phthalates are things that can come out of plastic when it's heating, though they've never actually shown that phthalates can cause cancer. It is concerning if these chemicals are coming out of your, your Tupperware and coming into your food, because I mean, how many of us use a microwave 20 times a week, right? So um, that is concerning. And so they found that this is a myth, one, because that phthalates are not actually leaching out of the plastic. And two, the plastic that goes in the microwave is safe to be heated at those temperatures. So you have to just always be sure that you look on the bottom of your um, food containers that it says microwave safe. Sometimes they'll also say dishwasher safe. That's telling you that it's of the integrity level, that it's not going to break down when you microwave it. Something that you do not want to do is like reuse um, those one time, and I love you, my green friends who like to recycle things and repurpose things, but your, your reused margarine tub that you now have your spaghetti in should not go in the microwave. Um, that plastic is not designed to handle those temperatures and it will break down. So you just need to be careful that when you microwave, you use microwave safe plastic. Okay. Oh, okay, you guys, now's the time for our heart to break peanut butter, peanuts, America's favorite food. Though I've heard when I traveled to Indonesia, they looked at me like, why on earth would you eat peanut butter? That's the grossest thing in the world. So I don't think that this is a global food thing. I think maybe this is an American food thing, but we love our peanut butter. Um, I don't know a child who hasn't had PBJ sandwiches um, growing up. And I put an asterisk here to say that it's a fact it can cause cancer. And I put might in the title because I want everyone out here to go freak out. Um, the problem is not the peanuts themselves. The problem is a mold called aspergillus that grows. And so I've shown this picture where you see a little bit of this mold growing on the shells here. And it's actually very common. Aspergillus is one of the most prevalent fungi. Their spores are everywhere. You're breathing them in right now. Um, don't freak out, <laughs> your body can handle it. Um, but they can produce a chemical called aflatoxin. And um, they're producing it mostly as kind of like biological warfare to tell other like fungi like, hey, this is my peanut, like stay away. Um, the problem is that that is the most potent carcinogen that has ever been found, ever, of any toxic chemical, of any radiation, of any virus, of anything that they've ever measured. 
this is the most potent carcinogen they have ever discovered. So it's not going to take a lot for this to give you cancer. And that's why we have a high concern level about this. Now, in the USA, the FDA is routinely testing peanut butter and corn and soybeans as well can get this mold um, for the presence of aflatoxin. And so any of these sort of mass produced FDA regulated forms of peanut butter or edamame are probably pretty safe. Um, but there have been several lapses that have actually been reported in the news. If you are getting your peanut butter from like the farmer's market um, or someone is hand canning it or um, you're importing your peanuts from Asia or Mexico, you need to be really, really careful. Um, they have much higher levels of this mold in places that are humid. So places like um, China, Thailand, South Korea, they actually um, have huge amounts of this mold and they have a large problem with liver cancer in those countries. Um, because this specific toxin causes liver cancer. So it is something to be aware of. And this is one of those few times you're gonna hear me say like, don't buy the farmer's market peanut butter. Um, buy the like Skippy or, or whatever brand like that, or just be like I am and switch to almond butter because um, almonds do not get this type and neither do hazelnuts. So if you like Nutella, you're also fine there. Okay, Saab, this one's for you before you get too sad, soy. Now, the initial concern with soy was that there's a group of chemicals in soybeans called isoflavones. And when they look at the chemical structure of isoflavones, they found out, wow, these look very similar to estrogen. And that's a concern because we know that when you mess up the levels of estrogen in the body, this can cause breast cancer. Um, it can cause ovarian cancer. And if someone who has breast cancer and you're eating soy products, this can mess up their treatment like tamoxifen or things that are used to fight breast cancer. So there was a huge concern. And maybe if we have any breast cancer survivors in the group, you guys will remember your doctors telling you to be careful of soy milk, to be careful of tofu. Um, we have now further researched it and found out that this is a myth and not something that you should be worried about. So the reason that we have um, the further evidence has shown is that they are too weak um, to make any change to the amount of estrogen that's already produced by your body. So they're like one one hundredth as strong. So these are things that um, your body is making way more estrogen than this could ever outbalance. And then the second thing, just because we want to ask in humans, OK, if you guys had to guess in the world, who do you think eats the most soy products? Who do you think eats the most tofu, the most edamame, the most soy milk? Um, vegetarian? Sorry. Yeah, vegetarians. Excellent. So vegetarians like me. <laughs> um, and also, if you were to look globally, it would be people in Asia. So what they did is they went and they said, okay, then that would mean people who are vegetarians should have a higher risk of breast cancer or people who live in Asia should have a higher risk of breast cancer because we're saying eating a lot of that causes cancer. And what we found was actually the opposite. Not only do they not have a higher risk of breast cancer in those populations, they actually have a lower risk of breast cancer. That actually suggests, and this will make every vegetarian happy in the room, that soy probably reduces your risk of cancer. Um, of course, we have to be sure it doesn't have aflatoxin on it, which is our little asterisk caveat. Okay, we are getting close to the end. I'm looking, I have like five minutes left and I'm trying my best to go fast. Um, alcohol is a group one carcinogen. Um, it is known to be associated with seven different types of cancer. This uh, breast, uh, colon, liver, your uh, esophagus, larynx, mouth. Um, I think those are all not uh, surprising as well as liver. Um, it's only dangerous though when consumed in excess. So remember that dose, dose is important. So what do we mean by excess alcohol? Because I think every one of us could have a different definition of what excess alcohol is. So what we mean for a beer, um, 12 ounces, for malt liquor, eight to nine ounces, for wine, five. I know that you have these wine glasses that are this big, but we're talking about like a regular wine glass half of that being filled, that's a five ounce wine glass or one shot. So for women, 
having one drink a day of any of these that you choose, you're fine. Men, you can have two drinks a day. As soon as you go over that, now you're in that excess category and your risk of cancer is going to go up. So you need to stay within that sort of limit. Okay, I think I just have a couple left. Uh, GMOs, this is a big one though. Um, for as long as GMOs have been there, people have vilified GMOs. Uh, this stands for genetically modified organism. This is where um, scientists have genetically modified plants with certain genetic traits. They can be things like survive better in drought. Um, they can be things like survive insects. Um, they can be don't be killed by herbicides. So there's lots of different traits and people are very suspicious of this engineered food especially after a French study came out that said that when they fed rats for their entire lifetime, nothing but uh, genetically modified corn, they began to develop tumors. Um, and that was very concerning because we know that genetically modified food is very prevalent throughout the world. Um, but recently, I think it was three years ago, the study was retracted. That is such a slap on the wrist for science to have your study retracted. That means that they have said it was grotesquely false, grotesquely done incorrectly, conflict of interest. And so they're pulling the study um, and saying it was so flawed that they can't even have it out in the published world anymore. Um, so some additional data that has been done since then has shown that when they use BT toxin, which is a genetic modification that people are very, very worried about, um, who are worried about GMOs at doses that are 500 to 2000 times what is actually present in the corn that we eat, that there was no toxicity in animals. And that in fact, when we ate that, the BT was degraded within five minutes of entering our body. So this isn't something that's like persisting, building up in our livers, you know, hanging out in our bodies, being stored in our tissues. It's being destroyed almost as soon as we eat it. And then perhaps more convincing data is looking at countries that have banned GMOs versus countries that have a, a large GMO usage. So the United States, um, we are number one. And um, when it comes to GMOs, we are the number one country for using GMOs. And so if eating GMOs causes cancer, you would then expect our cancer rates to be higher than countries that are not consuming GMOs. That would be the expected cause and effect. Um, and in fact, that's not what we see. So the US is number eight in the world for cancer risk, even though we're number one in GMO use. If you look at cancer risks for uh, number two, three, and four, which are New Zealand, Hungary, and Belgium, they don't use GMOs. They have banned them in their country since the beginning of time. So they have never used GMOs, but they have the second, third, and fourth highest cancer risk. The highest cancer risk in the world is actually Australia. And in Australia, um, they are number 12 in GMO use. So much, much further down the list than the United States. Um, okay, how am I doing on time, Tim? I can't see the clock. Do I, how am I doing? So you're doing fine. Okay. Um, I wanna leave some time at the end for discussion. So yeah. if you could do between five and seven more minutes, do you think? Yeah, I think okay. we only have a couple more slides. Okay. Um, that's what I'll do. Thank Everyone you. Everyone knows about salons. Yes. Yeah, so I just put this out because we have a lot of college age students in this presentation. And I know that a lot of them tell me, um, I it's okay. I don't sit out by the pool. I, I wear sunblock at the beach, but I go to the tanning salon um, and I get a base coat tan, right? Because if I get a base coat, then I'm safe. That's like somehow gonna protect my skin when I go out to the beach or go to the pool. Um, and especially I keep hearing this thing and I've actually seen it. They say safe UV in the windows of these salons. Have you guys seen, it's like crazy. There's no such thing as safe UV. What are these people talking about? Um, they have shown that people that do indoor tanning have a 75% increased risk of developing melanoma before the age of 35. And here's a big one for us um, super pale people in the world. If you have burned and peeled once in your life before age 18, your risk of skin cancer goes up by 87%. So sunblock is the key or protective clothing is the key. Okay, 
Um, I threw this in here because because I was so excited when I read this <laughs> preliminary studies. Um, I love garlic, don't get close. Um, I think it's delicious in food. Um, and there are preliminary studies that have shown that having a diet that has garlic can reduce your risk of colon cancer and stomach cancer, um, as well as hematologic. So these would be like leukemia or lymphoma. Um, and I was like, this is the best news ever. Just put it on my, my fries, put it on my lasagna put it on my garlic bread. Um, however, there's a couple of things that they're still looking into and that's why I have it as TBD right now. One thing is people who had cancer, it didn't make them uh, not die. So there was no lower mortality rate for those. So it seems like maybe it has prevention as a, a role, but not as a treatment to help you. Secondly, um, down here under the caution, they found that it has increased your risk of endometrial cancer, which is a form of uterine cancer that women can get. So that's a little concerning. You have to think about those balanced risk factors. And they've also found that it has problems with blood clotting. So if you're a person who's on a blood thinner like warfarin or Coumadin, then you have to be very careful about taking garlic supplements. It's something you should talk with your physician about. Okay, so I like to finish with my favorite slide of all time. The good news, <laughs> if you said that eating dark chocolate and drinking red wine can lower your cancer risk, then you were right. This um, is due to the fact of the high antioxidant content that is found in both of these called resveratrol. It's a very potent cancer fighting chemical that goes in and prevents DNA damage in your body. So you could be getting DNA damage from other things and kind of like a shield, the red wine goes in there and lays down over and protects your DNA from that damage. So it's a very strong um, antioxidant. Um, dark chocolate has the same resveratrol. So um, go at it. This is like my favorite snack to have at night, a nice glass of red wine, some dark chocolate, some nice red berries to get another um, antioxidant. It's the perfect anti-cancer. It's your homework today and for every day for the rest of your life to have this. Just remember that dosage, right? So um, even though we don't like to think so, red wine is alcohol. So you're still limited women to that one glass a day, men to two glasses a day. And then for the chocolate, if you eat too much, you're getting too much sugar. So you have to kind of limit it to one to one and a half ounces a day. Okay, so we made it. We've made it, here's our list. So see if you, what you guys got right or wrong. Here are your M for myth, F for fact. See how many of these you would have gotten right if you were able to do the full activity. Um, I'd like to finish with just sort of some uh, parting thoughts. Remember we were addressing, does everything cause cancer? Now we know that there are 120 things that have been identified. We also said that there's chronic misinformation, that it's important to fact check that it's important to get your information from valid sources. So I have listed for you here some valid sources for cancer information so that you can check out information yourself. Remember also that dose is important. Just because something has the ability to damage DNA doesn't mean you will be exposed to enough of that to be dangerous to your health. And then lastly, if you look at cancer overall, 42% of cancer is preventable, 50% of the most common. So we have a lot of work that we can do to help ourselves by looking at the risk factors and making smart choices. So I will finish with a quote. The science is not a major or a career. It is a commitment to a systemic way of thinking and explaining the universe through testing and factual observation. So even though you might say, I didn't major in science, we can all be scientists today after what we have learned. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to take questions. Well, that was excellent, Dr. Kud. Thank you very much. Nothing is more powerful than the, mitigation, uh, the migration of ideas, whether they're good or bad or true or not. Um, the ideas, around cancer have spread all over the world. And it's great to have the Dr. Coods of the world to neutralize those myths. And I also wanna add, I think you have unleashed 
the wine, chocolate, and garlic as a new science. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. We do have uh, folks with their hands up. Lori Canterbury has her hand up. If you want to unmute yourself, Lori, uh, you've been waiting very patiently. So you can go ahead and ask your question now. You know what, that actually was not a question. That was a response to a yes or a no at the beginning. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Lori. Sure, no Excellent. problem. Is there anyone who has a question? Uh, if you do, just unmute yourself and fire away. I, I don't bite. Um, I have a question, uh, and I, maybe I just missed it, but you'd mentioned somewhere in there, Kelly, about, um, I'm sorry, Dr. Kuhn, about um, uh, the fact that the incidence of cancers in Asia were higher than in other parts of the world. Um, and what was the explanation for that? Or is there an explanation? So um, that's a great question. Thank you, Dr. Kud, my father, Dr. Kud. Um, so one of the things that we think this is related to is if we look at the types of cancer, so in the United States, the top three cancers are uh, lung cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer. Um, and then the fourth will be colon cancer. And those are really tied specifically to our Western diet of eating a lot of red meat, eating a lot of saturated fat. In Asia, the top cancers are stomach cancer, liver cancer, and lung cancer. Liver cancer and stomach cancer are both tied to a virus and a bacterium. So the virus hepatitis B um, is very strongly linked to liver cancer. It's the number one risk for liver cancer. Um, and in the United States and other Western countries, we do have mandatory HBV vaccinations that occur, but they are not present in many Asian countries. Um, speaking about stomach cancer, which is linked to the bacterium Helicobacter pylori, we also see that diet plays a role. And one of the diets that um, is important are pickled, or salted foods. So if you think about like kimchi or um, pickled ginger or salted fish, these are very common diets throughout parts of Asia. And so that is um, increasing and leading to their higher risk of those cancers. And also a lot, of people, a lot of people smoke in Japan and Asia too, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So lung is their number one um, cancer. And that is because if you look at the trend lines about like um, where smoking is peaking in the world, um, the United States peaked about 10 years ago and is on the downward trend now for number of smokers, but parts of Asia are still on the upward trend. Um, so there is still a lot of prevalent smoking. I have a question. Yes. Oh, are your, will, will your slides be available online? Um, I'm happy to post them. I believe um, the um, ISP office said that they were gonna post this talk um, as a video on their webpage. And I'm sure that I can provide the slides to them as a link that you can look at as well if that's something people would like to look at further. I'm happy to share. I put, um, so in, the, I put in the chat the link to where uh, Dr. Kud's presentation will be. Give us a few days to put it up and then you'll have access to it uh, forever and ever. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Remember science is on a continuum. Things can change. Okay, that's my... <laughs> well, I, I do have a bacon question okay. that came up. Um, will vitamin C save me from my bacon habit? Mm. So um, vitamin C is another potent antioxidant. And it is definitely good within the limit of the dosage that is told. I think it's about 500 milligrams per day is the, is the dosage that you're supposed to have of vitamin C. And I've heard people saying things, well, that's okay. I'll take 30 pills of vitamin C if that sort of counteracts it. Um, that can cause toxicity and other problems. So you definitely don't want to overdose on your vitamin C. Um, so definitely vitamin C is a good thing to have added to your diet. But the type of damage that vitamin C protects against is not the same type of damage that is caused by bacon. So unfortunately, they are not a one-to-one -one cancel each other out um, type of a mechanism. <laughs> I have a question. Go ahead. Okay, so for the, there was a slide that had the working the night shifts and um, how there was sufficient evidence on animals, how like, um, like it causes cancer. So how would that work with nocturnal animals if they're like more likely to be out at night? 
So the, the work that they've looked on with, um, and this was predominantly done in nurses who tend to work the graveyard shift and they work that shift for many years of their life and they show that they actually have an increased risk of breast cancer if they work that type of a shift. Um, and that was actually because of shifts in the melan uh, melatonin, which is the chemical that kind of regulates your sleep-wake cycles and how their melatonin levels got off and how that led to downstream effects in their hormones, which were triggering the cancers. If an animal was a nocturnal animal, um, that species is going to already have a different expression pattern for their melatonin. So um, probably how you could hurt one of those animals would actually be to force them to be awake in the daytime, right? So that would be like having the reverse of their melatonin cycle, like it is for us to be awake in the evening time or overnight. So um, for them, they are biologically built to have their melatonin levels synced with the evening time versus ours or not. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. But thank Good, you. nice, good thinking skills. So my question was that like the, the spread of misinformation seems to be commonly with, um, companies is there anything that like you know everyday people can do to like hold more of these companies accountable for this kind of spread of misinformation i would say like also harmful product so I think that that's a fantastic question, Marina. And I think that um, when we have scientists working together with lawmakers, it's a perfect union, right? So right now there are majors that you can go into called science policy. These are individuals who not only understand the science, but can then work with government, work with law um, in helping to establish better regulations and better rules that can help to hold companies accountable for false information. Of course, we have places like the Better Business Bureau. Um, you can always submit um, complaints to them. I don't know strictly, um, not being a business person, how what type of injunctions they're allowed to put onto a business if they're um, spreading false information. Probably the biggest thing that starts happening is sort of that grassroots boycotting that you see, um, where people will say they don't have good um, green practices for the environment, so um, let's sign a petition. But I don't know. Um, I do think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that area in the future. I agree with you on that. OK, thank you. Sure. I actually had a quick question regarding the bacon as well. <laughs> I knew so, it. I knew the bacon was going to get you all. <laughs> so I I love my bacon. I don't eat obsessively with it. I rarely eat it once a week. <laughs> um, but I do know that um, lower or small intakes of red meat are able to help prevent cardiovascular disease as long as they're on the leaner side, not the fattier side. So then my question would kind of be, like would bacon be under that category of red meats? Cause I've known that it kind of increases the risk of cancer if you have large quantities or you intake a large amount of bacon, but then doesn't it kind of somewhat contradict the whole decrease in cardio cardiovascular disease? So I think it's a great question, Emma, and I think that this is part of the um, complicated part of science, right? Where we said, we're trying to look for a really simple, straightforward answer that can tell us, just tell me what to do, right? Tell me to do this, and that's gonna help my heart, and it's gonna lower my cancer, and it's, it's gonna do all the things that we want. And there's not a simple answer because not all things that lower your risk of cancer will also lower your risk of heart disease. Um, but thankfully, red meat is one of those that can. So um, bacon is definitely not a healthy red meat um, by anybody's standards. Um, it has, and the way that it's cooked, the way that it's prepared, you see all that fat, the saturated fat is there. It's had curing, so there are chemicals that have been added to it. So it's more those chemicals than nitrosamines. Um, as well as when you char and burn it, you get that blackening on bacon or that crispiness. That's also mm -hmm. a chemical that causes cancer. So I, I guess I would say, and this sounds gross, but if you were like eating um, raw bacon or <laughs> bacon that was like wrapped around Brussels sprouts and just baked instead of fried bacon, like maybe then it would behave more like the red meat that you want it to be. Um, okay. Yeah, but <laughs> fried, fried bacon is not. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Thank you. I think, sure. I think that might be the quote of the day. Uh, the red meat that you want it to be. <laughs> the red meat that you want it Any to be. Any excuse to have bacon. Yes. Um, I want to be very conscientious of people's time. It's, uh, it's now yeah. the 15 minutes after the hour. And so um, I can, of course, hold the room open for those who would like to stay. 
But at this point, uh, we'll stop the recording. And uh, I want to make sure that I do a shout out to some people who have really made this happen, which is Dr. Ripple and Dr. Matsumoto and Dr. Cheng Levine, who their guidance and leadership have brought this to us and the other forums. Don't miss tomorrow. We've got two great ones at 11 o'clock and at 2 o'clock. And uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I hope you go and visit this on YouTube. And if you're an instructor, I hope you use it in your classroom. Thank you very much.